Hey guys, I'm Annie, and of course this is Daniel Barth. <laughs> we um, Scott is on a trip right now um, for work, uh, work-related stuff, so he uh, messaged me and asked me to kind of hop on with uh, Dr. Barth today and um, kind of go over what he's been talking about. I'm excited. I'm really excited I'm about, about what this. you're talking about. Yep. <laughs> Glad to have you. So why, don't, yeah, so why don't you tell us a little bit about, about what you're going to talk about today? Well, we're going to talk about what happens when science goes bad. Uh, one of the themes on our show, Annie, we, uh, we deal with history of science a lot, and mm -hmm. we deal with the philosophy of science more than probably a lot of popular science educators and uh, commentators do. And one of the guys we bring up all the time is a fellow named Karl Popper. And Popper said, it's not this idealized scientific method like you learned in high school. Science is more of a cage match, last man standing. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, people in science try to knock down other people's theories, yeah. <laughs> uh, which is a lot more uh, a lot more full contact. And a lot of people <laughs> realize science actually is. But we yeah. also like to open up the show with a, a couple of fun things that go on because there's always other little topics that happen in science news that I don't get into my, uh, that don't make it to full show. But one of the things, uh, I'm, a, I'm a huge movie fan. Uh, in my house, there are three libraries. There's the uh, science fiction, wow. art, science, history library. There's the professional science and math library. And then there's a film library of almost 5,000 titles. Oh my goodness. Silent running. <laughs> yes, I know. Uh, <laughs> silent running. We don't do cable or broadcast here at the ranch. Uh, <laughs> silent running. Famous 1972, uh, kind of one of the first eco science fiction films with Bruce mm -hmm. Dern. And there are, the earth is being polluted to death. There are giant ships in space with all the tree and plant species, which are being saved to renew the earth someday. And mm -hmm. on the uh, ship, Bruce Dern kind of goes crazy, kills all his, his uh, shipmates, and he's taking care of the trees uh, with the help of little robots. And if you can imagine a 1972 version of animated robots, well, they have the mm -hmm. real robots now. They're called Spheres, oh. which is a cutesy name. But NASA and I don't know, I want to meet up in a dark alley with the guy who makes up the acronyms. <laughs> Synchronize, <laughs> position, hold, engage, reorient, experimental satellites. That is a mouthful. <laughs> That's awful. That's, oh my God. That's awful. Anyway, couldn't they just call them something fun like harpies? You know, that, from yeah. Greek legend that fly around and <laughs> harass you but won't let you die? Uh, no, they had to come <laughs> up with but there's a, there's crazy. a nice picture and, uh, we've given you a link to the NASA website for the spheres robot. It's really mm -hmm. cool. They basically have robots that orient themselves with fans in three dimensions. So they're kind of like drones, but in zero G, mm -hmm. as you can imagine, there are more interesting issues for navigation. Um, uh, but they, they take readings on the atmosphere, they engage with the astronauts, and they can help with some repetitive activities for data collection and other things, but very cool and science fiction orientation there. Um, the so other not, thing- so not, so not remote controlled at all then? You know, that I'm not certain of. Okay. Um, I'm not certain, I, I believe they're programmed Okay. Uh, but I, I think they're designed that, as I understand it, they're designed to be independent of the astronauts. So nobody has to, you know, the little console people sit there with their thumbs and work them with the drums. Yes. Mm -hmm. They didn't want mm -hmm. the astronauts to have to do that. They wanted yeah. these robots to be kind of like a Roomba, autonomous and able to okay. do their job without you. Okay. And uh, so it's kind of Roombas in space. Maybe that's a little degree for how I think these things no, it's undoubtedly actually, that's, are. That's, that's actually a nice concept to think about because I know that that's a common thing in households today is to have a Roomba yes. that just knows what to do and it so, knows the it knows this this uh, the space that it and, has it knows yeah I can't yeah. help it I'm sorry but do you think they let their cats ride them 
<laughs> you know what? They always uh, there's always plushies, you know, stuffed um. animals for the, and that's been a tradition since the the, the 60s to have a, a mm-hmm. stuffed animal. I guess Yuri Gagarin started it, so maybe they'll mm-hmm. have. And uh, what is it? ESA announced that Sean the sheep was on going to ride the Artemis rocket. And, really? Uh, they, yeah. Yes, yeah. And, yes uh, I, yeah, I know that. Show. Cafe I know that show. animation. Yeah. Studios, yeah. Sean the Sheep. We love Sean the Sheep here. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, He's amazing. Grandkids, you know, when they get Sean the yeah. Sheep, yay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, uh, yeah, maybe they could have Sean the Sheep ride one of those spheres, which I think would be, you know, Pathé, if you're listening, you know, uh, Ardman, <laughs> if you're listening, there you go. Um, make the phone call. Make this happen for me. A <laughs> um, couple of other fun things. Right, um, right, right, there right, are yeah, some there new books out. See, this is what I was thinking. Uh, about. I got this after waiting for. Oh, there's there's cats on Roombas. <laughs> yes, uh, and I, I saw a video the other day that a Roomba sucked up a dog's tail. <laughs> oh my goodness! And there was. Uh, I guess Amazon is buying Roomba now, and there are some oh. people who were. Oh, that's adorable. There were some people on uh, online who were uh, worried because. <laughs> Uh, Amazon owns Roomba, and Roomba has a map of your house. Hello, data oh. breach. We don't have a Roomba but, here. But, the, <laughs> but maybe they we can have, get more intricate dogs. on where, have, where they... <laughs> you have dogs that eat everything. I love that. Yes, exactly. We have my service dog, Parker, and then uh, two older dogs, Buncher and Whimsy. And awesome. anything falls on the floor, they immediately investigate. And if it's, uh-huh. if it's yeah. at all edible... That includes that's, things yeah. like peanut shells and other things you wouldn't think that's, edible. That's why oh, I yeah. can't do Alexa or uh, Google. Hey, hey, Google or whatever it is. Because no, I don't either. Yeah, no, yeah. but Siri that's doesn't true. send it out. It out. does it on your phone, so you don't have to worry about them recording anything because it doesn't. That's one reason it doesn't yeah. work as well as the others. But whatever. Yeah. I use uh, I use Google DuckDuckGo and Wolfram Alpha. I don't exclusively use Google. Google isn't uh, tech enough for some of the stuff I do for the show. <laughs> in my own um, yeah. But uh, the other thing, I'm just gonna hold this up. Just got a uh, a new book after waiting for months for this to be released. The Red Planet: A Natural History of Mars, and uh, this came in today. And uh, I opened it up and said, ooh, and my wife immediately grabbed it and said, I get first go. <laughs> and she's sitting over in the couch flipping pages and going, ooh, you're going to like this. So <laughs> <clears throat> you have her word on it. Uh, and, uh, of course, uh, we're hoping that uh, people have been getting their copies of Star Mentor. Uh, mm-hmm. For those of you who have a, a telescope and are wondering what can I do next, um, more than 50 projects, all of them have follow-up activities, so literally hundreds of things for you to do with your telescope. And uh, we are, yes, it's on Amazon. We're, uh, we are currently negotiating with uh, Scott to have uh, Explore carry it and bundle it with every telescope you also have. Well, we're starting to get uh, some nice reviews in, and please, folks, if, you, if you're getting your copies, we hope you'll review. And uh, we... Have a, we, I got a review, was sent to me by an astronomer uh, who was very nice. He said, Dr. Barth's book mm-hmm. is a joy to read. It's Dr. Barth's love and enthusiasm for astronomy that keeps you turning the pages and moving forward. His tone is relaxed and friendly. It's really like a casual conversation with an old friend, which I, I blush to the roots of the hair that I do not have. Um, it, was, it was very lovely. <laughs> Uh, so we're hoping folks are getting their copies, and I would love to hear from some of the uh, regular viewers on the show. If you've got your copies, would love yeah. to hear from you here. So yeah, if you're other- yeah, if you, yeah, if you're if you're out there, give us a shout out if you uh, if you've bought his book and if you've Please. read it. I mean, that would be that would be really neat to be able to and hear if you have, um, uh, from our audience. Yeah. If you have questions, you know, if you've read the book and you're like, "What the heck is the old guy talking about?" I get that a lot in class. It doesn't bother me. <laughs> <laughs> so we'd be happy to take your questions on class uh, like it was class anyway. So mm-hmm. uh, I'm starting classes up uh, August 22nd. I'll be going back in and teaching yeah. another 
uh, another year's worth of Astronomy for Educators, um, which is the program at the University of Arkansas where I train teachers, primarily K-8 teachers, to, uh, to teach astronomy uh, to younger children. And uh, I think it's a, it's a fundamental thing to do. And if you're interested in those kind of activities, you can put Astronomy for Educators into any search engine. It's a free book. Uh, I gave that one to the University of Arkansas to publish mm -hmm. and give away free. And uh, right now we're in about, we're closing in on 9,000 schools worldwide. And wow. uh, the book serves somewhere between 300 and 400,000 students a year. Uh, so okay. that many teachers who, can't be wrong. And there's yeah. lots of fun activities. If you're just an amateur astronomer or if you're a parent with a child who says, I want a telescope, uh, it's a great way to introduce them to some good science concepts with okay. things you can do at home at the kitchen table or in the classroom on the desktop. And all of them are designed to be very low cost. Um, I designed so is that, the is that is that, is that age, is that ages kindergarten through eighth grade? Is that what you said? That those books? Uh, I train teachers who want to teach K through eight. Okay. Occasionally okay. I have people who want to teach astronomy in high school, but most of okay. them are in the regular physics program. The Astronomy for okay. Educators is a STEM program at the University of Arkansas okay. That's awesome. uh, in the College of Education. So okay. I bring my students out to my ranch. They get to use equipment that the university purchases. They learn to use telescopes, binoculars. They learn to use a planisphere. They learn to sketch and draw and make simple models. For instance, do you want to teach about phases of the moon? Here's uh, some models that I make with ping pong balls and Gatorade bottle caps and markers. And with these, cool. you can teach. Yeah, you can show not only what phase happens next, but mm -hmm. within a few minutes, students can understand how this works. And of course, mm -hmm. the way it works for our Earth and Moon, is the way it works for mm -hmm. every planet anywhere in the universe, because light from a sun falling on a planet and a moon, it's always mm -hmm. the same. The principles are identical. So I that's like lots how of fun. I like I like how you um, incorporate hands on with learning, because sometimes like for me personally, I'm not a, I'm. I, I can read books, but I'd have to read it like five or six times to for, for it to actually. Are you a, are you a um, kinesthetic learner? Someone who likes yes. to put yes, your hands on? Yes, very, very um, much. So I'm a hands-on learner. So yeah. The reason I and I I I came to education from research science. Okay, so I was not mm -hmm. a hands-on learner. I was I was not a, a formally trained teacher from the start. I was a research scientist. When okay. I came to teaching, they said, we really need somebody to teach physics. And from there, I said, I want to teach astronomy. Uh, they said, we can't. I said, sure you can, just watch me. Well, there's no book, I'll write one. There's no curriculum, I'll develop it. <laughs> and awesome. uh, you know, I had no idea what kind of a job I was taking on. Yeah. Uh, I was a young man in my mid twenties, but I just, I just put my head down and away I went having, uh, having uh six bigger brothers uh you know <laughs> you can just say you're chicken i dare you and that was enough to, to set me off. um that's great yeah even my little brother is bigger than me so there you go oh wow but uh wow. that's lots of fun the other thing i've been getting a lot of questions about online is the perseid meteor shower and so okay. uh folks if you have a if you have a planisphere and uh, Explore sells a lovely, uh, I believe it's the Tyrion. Am I correct, Paul? Yes. The Tyrion plant here, and he's nodding. Yes. yes. And mm -hmm. this is this is. Uh, I'm not sure who made this one. It's not Tyrion, but I've had it for ever and ever. Oh, this is a David Chandler model. But anyway, uh, if you have your, and I I don't know if we can show this, if this will show online, but if you take your planisphere, and I'm trying to see if I can get it in focus here, it's not working. Anyway, if you take your planisphere and you rotate it so that you see Perseus on the eastern hemisphere, in other words, there's labels here for west, north, east. So you rotate it so that Perseus is just showing above the eastern horizon. And then you uh -huh. look at the date ring. 
And if we go ahead and we put Perseus, there it is, Perseus on the eastern horizon. If I look on my date ring here, and here's August, and I see that for August 10th, Perseus comes up at about 11 p.m. And so I can look at my, my planet sphere here and see when Perseus is just above the horizon. That's when the best meteor show begins for the Perseus awesome. meteors. And uh, so anytime, and one interesting thing I've heard people grumbling, ah, the full moon is going to ruin the <laughs> meteor shower. Um, you know what? Hello, dark sky, serious observers. Now you get to <laughs> live like a city dweller for a couple of nights. Because basically now we all have the same shot. Because whether you're yeah. in downtown or suburban or rural or, you know, ultra dark sky, it's basically going to be this, pretty much the same. <laughs> the moon is going to, the moon is going to uh, basically drown out an awful lot of the constellation stuff for you. So only the big, okay. bright, flashy meteors are going to punch through the glow, but that's okay. Uh, for novice observers, full moon night means it's not really dark, which means it's not really scary. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you don't need anything special for meteor shower observing. Uh, a lawn chair or a blanket and uh, uh, to lie on in a pillow and a thermos of coffee, hot chocolate, or soup. And uh, you can just lie down with your feet pointing east and relax. You don't need binoculars. You don't need telescope. You don't need anything special. <laughs> and just go, ooh, it's a meteor. And it will be extremely wonderful. Uh, and I'm, I'm hoping that uh, that will be good for everybody. Get out there and enjoy the dark skies. There are other meteor yeah. showers. This isn't the only one. It's the one that gets the most, uh, it gets the most press. And mm -hmm. teachers are often frustrated. That's happening before I go back to school. It's okay. <laughs> There's the Orionids, which are around Halloween. And a lot of times people don't do that one. My kids are going to go trick-or-treating. They don't want to be. Uh, the other one, my personal favorite was always the Leonid meteor shower. When okay. I taught high school and college, we would go to the football stadium. And we would get the custodians to shut down all the lights because we would gather about 1030 at night get everybody into the football stadium, close the doors. Now all my students are in an enclosed area. Random outsiders can't wander in and the kids can't mm -hmm. wander off. Uh, and we would observe all night long. There were bathrooms in the stadium, which was great. We would have, uh, there was also a snack stand and we would have parents come and man the snack stand and some parents would make soup and some would make chili and some would buy uh, you know, the little small snack bags of chips and what at Costco. And uh, it was a great family event. And if you haven't done this with your family, it's it's a great thing. And uh, we used to gather at 10 and we go till dawn. <laughs> and uh, we did some of them we did back in the day up in the mountains, uh, up in the San Jacinto Mountains uh, above Hemet and mm -hmm. San Jacinto. And sometimes we would go out into, we went out to uh, Joshua Tree one year, but a lot of times we just go to the football stadium. So if you're a teacher and you're thinking about doing a meteor activity, uh, I encourage you to make it a whole class family night fun. Um, it's, it's, really, it's really the best. And if you can get in an, in an enclosed stadium environment where everybody's safe and secure and parents are relaxed, it's a blast. It's a blast. Everybody enjoys themselves and it's a great time. So there we go. And what and what a great way to open up open up um, your children and your family to to the space and what's going on in the sky. You know, I mean, that's that's how I started off with I have a five year old. That's how I started off with him was the moon. He always was noticing the moon. And then I started working here and I got a telescope and um, it's just grown since then. And he really loves the night sky now. And so um, it's, that's a that's a really neat opportunity to be able to educate um, your family and your children and stuff. So that's it is. Cool. It is. Cool. Um, I have uh, very pleased that a number of homeschool groups around Northwest Arkansas are using mm -hmm. some of the activities from uh, astronomy for educators and star mentors for their children in homeschool. And if anybody's interested in that, or if you know homeschool parents who might be, 
uh, they're welcome to contact me at astronomyforeducators at gmail.com and I will give you information, lesson plans, access to the free book and you can get started with that. So with all that fun, let's transition over today's topic when yes. science goes bad. there was there was uh there was a science controversy this week annie did you hear about it there was no a, i did not this very well-known astronomer in france mm -hmm. who took a slice of chorizo sausage which is a mexican sausage yes. and mm -hmm. he put it on a black velvet background and he photographed it and he said oh the web telescope takes its first photo of a distant star. <laughs> and wow. You can, you can it, oh, you can Google fake picture of a star, comma, JWST, and I'm sure it will come up. And uh, crazy. It's, it's a very red, the meat is very red. I don't know uh, what they put in it, probably a lot of paprika or whatever. But it's very mm -hmm. and so it kind of it kind of looks like a star. It's kind of crazy, and uh, he said, "Oh, it's just a joke." But boy, did he get slammed when people figure out figured out they'd been had. Sometimes I'm it's sure a prank. He, I'm sure he had a lot of angry angry people. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm yeah, looking. sometimes it's a prank. Sometimes it's a little more than a prank. I'm sure you remember mm -hmm. Cold Fusion. Remember Cold Fusion? Mm -hmm. uh, I was at Caltech mm -hmm. when Cold Fusion came out. <clears throat> and there was a huge beehive of activity. And when it was proved wrong, there were a lot of both ha in your face and really angry people at Caltech. <laughs> wow. I, it, it really stirred people up. What does it look Sometimes like? it's just an honest mistake. Sometimes you, you go ahead and you put something out there and it turns out it's not true. There have been Nobel uh -huh. prizes given for things that aren't true. Wow. Um, I believe somebody got a, a Nobel prize for uh, a particular um, particular bacteria that caused cancer and it wasn't true at all. Uh -huh. And there have, been, there have been Nobel prizes for things that just weren't true. Uh, and sometimes really the we've talked many times about the idea of, of, of Galileo and Mm -hmm. His Copernicus's sun-centered solar system versus the Earth-centered solar system of of Aristotle mm -hmm. and others, and for a thousand years you had these two competing theories. Mm -hmm. Some very very smart people, famous people, said, "Oh, I believe in this one," and it was wrong, but they were taken at their word because they're really smart. You know, if you come up mm -hmm. and you say, you know, "Einstein was really wrong about gravity," and here's how it really works. You're either brilliant or you're a crackpot. You know, <laughs> you're either brilliant or you're a knucklehead. Uh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> I have I have a number of books in my library. People have sent to me, oh, Dr. Barth, you're a well-known astronomer. Would you review my book? I, I've shown how Einstein was wrong. There it is. There's there's this chorizo star from I, I cannot, cannot believe that people that fell people for fell that being a star. Oh yes, people I did. Never, I never. I'm sitting there looking at it. I'm trying to it. figure out what it is, right? And, and which one it which, which one, one it is. And I immediately yeah, recognize that right. not as a star, not star but as yeah, a yeah, piece of sausage. Piece of sausage. Yeah, it's it's. Uh, <laughs> it was always a sausage. And the, the picture I saw of this originally was not that well focused, so it was a little fuzzy. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. And when I first when I first saw it, I went, "Ooh, interesting! I'm going to have to look that up, and maybe it'll be the subject of another program." And then a few days later, it came out that it was a fraud, or a fake, or a joke, or a prank, however you want to call it. Uh, but. It was um, like I said. Sometimes, sometimes it's honest mistakes, and sometimes yeah. somebody says, "I believe this," and it's not true, but it just gets accepted. And uh, Scott and I have talked about things we learned as students, as young boys, that aren't true. Mm -hmm. We were told, uh, and Scott will confirm this for you. We were, I was taught in school. Well, the Earth's crust is too stiff. This stuff about drifting continents is garbage. It can't happen. Mm -hmm. What could possibly move a continent? It, 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 that's not true. Uh, the idea that the continents are drifting and spreading apart, just not right. Um, I was taught all the volcanoes on the moon were volcanic. Uh, 
there might be an asteroid wow. crater up there somewhere, but probably not. I was taught mm -hmm. there are no other solar systems with planets. There are none. This is it. <laughs> uh, yeah. I was, uh, I was taught that in Catholic school, but it, when I transferred to public school, it was reiterated. They taught the same thing. I was taught mm -hmm. the Earth and Moon were once one blob of material. They spun really fast, and they split apart into two bodies. Um, that wasn't right either. And this was simply a case of people being wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. it was it was less than it was about forty years ago when the whole asteroid killed the dinosaurs first appeared in the scientific literature. That's a very modern mm -hmm. idea. Um, yeah. Sometimes, sometimes wrong ideas are promoted or rejected for political reasons. And mm -hmm. the two most famous, of course, are Lamarckian evolution. Lamarck said that, oh, if you work out and you get strong, your children will be born strong. If, you know, uh, if your mom has uh, an auto crash and gets a disfiguring injury, your children could be born with a disfiguring injury. Uh, and it's, it's completely balderdash. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not true. The Nazis, of course, Hitler in particular, uh, rejected relativity as the insane ravings of a deranged Jew. Uh, forgive me for quoting the worst human being of all time, but he rejected he rejected scientific ideas for political reasons. That's some excellent. And he was wrong. Run for his money. Um, but sometimes, in the worst cases. It's a matter of greed, people who are trying for to grab power, money, and influence. Yeah. Uh, I can't imagine having a single night's sleep if I perpetrated some fraud and I said, oh, look at my new book. I've got this great idea about whatever. And even if I did it as a joke and then it became... We've all heard of the pranks that run away, right? Mm -hmm. And how do I yeah. stop it now that it's snowballed? But I, I, yeah. I couldn't let it go before I said, no, no, stop. This is, uh, what was it? There was a, a famous art fraud of a statue dug up in Greece. And it was some Greek god and it was missing a thumb. And mm -hmm. uh, people were arguing whether it was a fraud or whether it was real. And the art community eventually decided that it was real. And it was displayed and it went around the world. It was in museums. And a guy finally came forward about 20 years later and said, no, no, it's a fake. And they said, Gosh. well, who the hell are you? And he said, no, I made it as a fake. Well, you couldn't do this. You couldn't fool all of us. And then he brings out the thumb. Oh, my and gosh. And said, yes, I did. And I'm sorry. Oh, gosh. Why did it take him 20 years? <laughs> Well, That's a lot of I, guilt. I think, I, I think he intended it as a uh, a small time scam to sell it for a few thousand dollars to some gullible people, and it just yeah. it snowballed. It snowballed, and he, somebody he sold it to was famous enough to say "ooh" to the art and historical community and say, "Look what I have! I bought it from this doofus who sold it to me for five thousand dollars, and look what I have! It's worth millions. It's priceless treasure." Yeah. And it just kind of snowballed from there. The guy didn't know what to do about it. Well, you speak up, thank you. Um, but of course, <laughs> he didn't go to jail for fraud. Um, and again, Karl Popper, there's two big guys I like, and yes, I encourage you to read. Uh, Karl Popper, who is relatively recent, he died in 94. Uh, and he's famous for saying, and I use this phrase, Karl probably wouldn't like it. Sorry, Dr. Popper. Uh, but science is like a cage match. It's the last man standing. People spend time, money, and uh, part of their, much of their careers trying to take down. Because if you can take down a famous theory, why you're immediately mm -hmm. famous. This, of course, is why Einstein was famous, the first man in 350 years to correct Newton, right? Yeah. First guy in 300 yeah. years to say, no, 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 Newton's wrong. Uh, and here's how I can prove it. Um, and, uh, so, and of course, why was Galileo and, and Copernicus famous? 
the first people in 2000 years to say Aristotle was wrong and the earth is not the center mm -hmm. of the solar system. So <clears throat> tumbling one of the icons of science and getting up on their pedestal as the replacement, that's an intro to fame and fortune. Mm -hmm. uh, Karl Popper called this empirical falsification. The other guy we like to talk about is Tom, Thomas Kuhn, Structure of Scientific Revolutions is his book. And he basically said, mm -hmm. <coughs> excuse me, new ideas in science get accepted when the last old guy supporting the old false idea dies. He basically said new ideas are great, but they really make their way into literature and education when the old people who supported the last theory are finally dead, gone, or retired from their position. And the new person comes in who likes the new idea. And mm -hmm. so... Thomas Kuhn said there's this institutional uh, there's this institutional lag or friction that delays mm -hmm. the acceptance of the idea. But Popper reminds us, and this is something I tell my students, I think they don't really get it most of the time, proof in science isn't possible. Scientists, reputable scientists, don't use the word proof. And my students use it in their writing all the time, and I cross it out with my big red pen. I go, uh, here's my red pen. I go, no. Uh, mathematical proof, geometrical proof is fine because numbers are eternal and always the same. Yeah. Scientific proof, you're going to prove, oh, there can be no, uh, no neutron star bigger than 1.4 solar masses, or then you'd have to check every neutron star ever to Probably. see if it didn't go over the planet. And you can't do that. Yeah. That's why reputable scientists say uh, we are. This vaccine works eighty six point four percent of the time with one dose and ninety seven point five percent with two doses. Well, why isn't there a perfect vaccine? Was screwing it up? Couldn't you run it and filter it one more time and make it work right? Uh, I want an absolute guarantee that this operation will cure me of my cancer or mm -hmm. that tonsillectomy will be perfectly safe. No reputable mm -hmm. doctor or scientist will say that because in science, there is no proof. We have confidence. We say, oh, we are 99.6% sure. Well, why aren't you completely sure? Because we can't test everything always. We don't have yeah. a time machine and we, we won't live forever. We have data. We do statistics. And a lot of people, well, you're just fudging the numbers because you don't really know. But that's that's simply ignorance speaking, not not qualified science. So even things like Newton's universal law of gravitation, you know, we don't say things like universal law anymore. We just don't do that. Mm -hmm. Newton's universal law of gravitation, that's a historical artifact, and science is really old. We have these really curious old terms <laughs> that we just keep out. But if you get into physics and astronomy, you will learn pretty quickly. If you're going fast enough or if you're massive enough, the regular old Newtonian gravity breaks down. And frankly, nobody yeah. knows what happens at the middle of a black hole because all our physics equations blow up. Even what happens inside of a neutron star, we don't know because yeah. our equations don't handle those extreme situations well. Einstein himself said, oh, there's this anomaly to the orbit of Mercury. It's really small, but we've been observing it for a couple of centuries. Well, mm -hmm. there, there must be some invisible planet Vulcan, which inside close to the sun, which messes with Mercury. Nobody found it. People claim to find it, but nobody actually found it. It wasn't there. And Einstein said, no, it's, it's not another planet. Newton's broken because Mercury is too close to the sun, which is too big. It messes with space time. And the whole, I'm not gonna go into relativity theory here today, but <laughs> Einstein said there are places where Newton doesn't work and you have to switch mm -hmm. to these new equations. And then mm -hmm. it works perfectly. Uh, well, it, so, it, it kind of, it, so Dr. Barth, it kind of sounds like if we didn't have those errors in, in science, we wouldn't be able to, um, we wouldn't be able to learn and grow. I mean, if we were, correct. if everything was concrete, like math, mathematics correct. and equations and stuff, then we would be stuck in the same, in the same correct. thing all the time. So, 
when That's we neat. find data that doesn't fit the old theory, people get really excited. This is the <laughs> crack in the edifice mm -hmm. of the old theory that says, ooh, new exciting science. Um, yeah. Some of my viewers may have heard about the shakeup with the standard model and how many neutrinos are there? Uh, different kinds, that is, folks, not individual mm -hmm. neutrinos, of course. <laughs> but uh, there's there's been some data that doesn't seem to fit the standard model. And uh, yeah. the science community has been abuzz with this because maybe this means exciting new science is, is coming toward us. And for young scientists, it means here's an exciting new opportunity to make a breakthrough, to become known and famous and uh, maybe make more than minimum wage as a research scientist. <laughs> uh, I left research science folks because the pay was awful. Uh, I was working at Caltech uh, <laughs> and I was a research staffer at the very uh -huh. most junior level. I was making $14,000 a year and having trouble paying oh my, my rent. Oh my and, gosh. Uh, at that time, uh, California was fast tracking new teachers. And as a mm -hmm. teacher, I could get a 50% raise. <laughs> I could go from 14 to $21,000 mm. and uh, I could get better benefits. And so I, I left research science and the people at Caltech, my, my boss said, well, you should, you know, enroll and pursue your master's and PhD here and move on in this field. It's doing molecular genetics. And uh, oh, wow. I left that entirely and went to teaching and I was going to teach biology. And they said, no, no, you have training in physics and we want a physics teacher. And so I, I taught one semester of biology and uh, never again, even though I was a Caltech uh, <laughs> guy. Um, so there you go. Crazy. You're like, no, you're like, not my thing. <laughs> No, and actually, uh, I, I'm very thrilled that I did. I, I really enjoyed teaching physics a lot. It was more hands-on. Uh -huh. And uh, yeah. the other thing, virtually my entire career, I was the only physics teacher on board. And sometimes in high schools of two and 3,000 kids, I was still the only physics astronomy guy. And because mm -hmm. it was me, I didn't have to share my toys. And I didn't have to uh, wonder about would my colleagues agree to teach X, Y, or Z was my program entirely. Yeah. And uh, I love that. It's the only way. <laughs> you, had, you had no backlash uh, or, or, no back or arguments. That's right. I'm the only astronomy for educators teacher <laughs> in the College of Education at the University awesome. of Arkansas, which is, I love that too. Uh, so let's talk about Alzheimer's disease. Wait, what? Okay. Um, <laughs> this, is where, this is where our story starts. And Alzheimer's syndrome, and uh, I'm going to say, Alice Alzheimer, I'm sure I'm slaughtering that, sorry. Uh, he discovered brain plaques more than 100 years ago, 1906. <clears throat> and he's dissecting the brain, so cognitively, what they would have called at the time, uh, senile dementia. And he found commonality in all these patients. They had these brain plaques. And he said, well, maybe these brain plaques, which aren't in healthy older adults, are the cause. <clears throat> and... Uh, it's discovered that what these molecules, these are made of called amyloid beta. And so amyloid beta plaques have been a focus of research for more than a century. And it starts with Alzheimer himself in the early 1900s. Um, and people have been trying to find an amyloid beta drug therapy for decades. If there's a drug we can give you and it stops you from forming these amyloid beta plaques, uh, not only the stakes are beyond thought, First of all, millions of people worldwide who could be helped. And for the companies that develop and sell and market drug therapy, mm -hmm. billions and billions of dollars in revenue. If you could have a successful Alzheimer's drug tomorrow, and if it was approved by the FDA and their counterparts in Europe, I, the, you would be wallowing in money. Huge. Mm -hmm. The returns are huge. Nobody's been able to find an amyloid beta drug therapy that works. But drug companies and universities and research institutions are all want to throw money at this because they see it as a promising potential area. 
And so mm -hmm. it's like playing a big money poker game, right? I'll, I'll raise you, I'll call. And for a university whose professor discovered this drug, wow, fame, fortune, you get to recruit new people, you get new research grants, a lot of money and prestige and influence and power. Uh, just in the last fiscal year, amyloid beta research consumed 1.6 billion, 1 billion in the United States. Uh, oh I'm sure goodness. a comparable amount in Europe and in various countries in Asia. So we're talking what, maybe six to 10 billion a year. Uh, since 2006, more than 25 billion has been spent. Uh, and so a huge amount of money has been thrown on this. Well, there was a paper in, uh, I believe this was in 2006, and this paper came out, and this paper is the most influential research study in the entire field. It's been cited more than 2,300 times. And uh, there's an image there, and I think uh, Paul can show that to us. And I'm going to show you this image, folks, but I'm not going to try to interpret it for you because I am not a, an image analyst, nor am I an Alzheimer's expert. But you see these, uh, these images here, of, and these are... Uh, basically electrophoresis gels. They're called Western blots. And I won't go into that either, but if you've ever done one of these chromatography experiments in high school where you put some chlorophyll and you put it in a tank with some solvent and it runs up the paper and it separates out the individual kinds of chlorophyll, uh, this kind of, this is basically an electric chromatography and it's done, this is how DNA analysis is done. And what the scientists do is they tag a marker to what they're looking for, and the marker is fluorescent. And then they do this electrophoresis gel and it separates out. And that's how, that's how this research works. It's a, it's a fairly complex technique, but more importantly, these electrophoresis gels are rather like the, if you've done um, in high school, if you've done an auger plate, where you've taken a plate of auger medium and you've taken and rubbed something over it and you see bacteria grow. Uh, and it's this thick jelly that the auger gel, and this is very similar type of technique, except they put an electric field across it to drag and separate out the molecules. And the problem is that these electrophoresis gels, they are not susceptible to being preserved long-term. They're this organic jelly-like material and it's it, mold and bacteria will grow on it. They will spoil, they will dry out. And that's why when you do this research, you take photographs of your results and you publish the photographs. But can we go back and look at your original gels, please? No, the answer is almost certainly no. The answer to that is you have this set up. Here's the instructions. Repeat it for yourself. I can't show you my original material. I can show you the photos, but I can't show you the original material. Mm -hmm. Very different from astronomy, where if someone says, oh, I've discovered a new supernova and here's the coordinates, everybody with a telescope can go look at it. Mm -hmm. Hubble can look at it, Webb can look at it, I can take out my 12 inch Dobsonian and look at it, mm -hmm. or you know, we can all go look and the original thing is still there. If someone says, I've discovered a fossil of a new dinosaur, somebody says, well, I don't believe it's really a new kind of tyrannosaur. Well, fine. Here it is. It's assembled in a university or an art gallery or a museum. Go look at it. But mm -hmm. with these biological experiments, because of the very nature of biological materials, they, are, they decay, they degrade, and we can't mm -hmm. keep the original stuff. So all we have is the photos. But as we all know, I can photograph myself in, I can Photoshop <laughs> myself into uh, a photograph yeah. with Biden on the right hand and the Pope on my left hand, yeah. you know, and uh, Einstein putting a medal around my neck. And it's, everybody was there, ha ha, Dr. Barth, Einstein's dead. Uh, well, yes, but some of the people who do Photoshop frauds are very, very clever. And we know this. 
we know mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. The idea that the camera never lies, everybody would go, you know, in 2022, people <laughs> would go, who are you, Rube? You know, gullible isn't in the dictionary. Cameras never lie. Well, <laughs> well even back <laughs> in the day, the... Oh, yes. I mean, you, you still... You can go back to the 1800s and find photos that are manipulated that look real, and sure. they're not for the so most the part. So the original, uh, what was one of the first uh, films, the Lumiere Brothers and Man in the Moon and the Moon with the Rocket in its Eye, and there were yeah. trick yeah. photography of a guy's head blowing up and then exploding. Yeah, Jeez, trick photography has been a or... thing. Yeah, since it's, ever. It's yeah. It's the old it's vaudeville the old trick. Like, it is a vaudeville trick. But here, what we have is photographs that were sent to a scientific journal. Science, in fact. And this is a peer-reviewed journal. You don't just write an article and send it in. They go, oh, cool, and they publish it. No, 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 no. Yeah. They take your work, and they contact other people in the field who are, very, who are experts. And they say, oh, scientist Bob has sent us this thing. Uh, scientist Alice, scientist George, scientist Francois, will you look at this work and tell us if you think it's valid? Because they don't, the editors don't rely on being knowledgeable enough to decide. This is why, in fact, Einstein never got a Nobel Prize for relativity. There was nobody in the world who was clever enough to look at it and say, yes, it's really, really true, or no, it really, really isn't. And the Nobel Prize Committee even you know, 20 years after said, you know what, you're obviously brilliant. They gave him a Nobel Prize for uh, the uh, photoelectric effect, not for relativity. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> so you look at this stuff and these, this paper, which is about amyloid beta, this has been cited and used for the basis of billions, tens of billions of dollars of research. And it turns out somebody came along this year and said, you know what, wait a minute, this author, Sylvain Lesnay, and again, I'm sorry if I've messed up your name, uh, but this lead author, they said he faked it. There were very sophisticated scientists who are also sophisticated photo image analysts. And they went in and they said, you know, there's problems. We've looked at these images that were provided to us by the journal Science, and it shows evidence of photo manipulation. Yeah. <clears throat> and yeah, they said, oh, he's been manipulating. He's been using one thing and republishing it as new data and changing it just slightly to make it look like it was different. But there was enough stuff in there to say, no, no, this all comes from the same thing. This comes from the same data. And these photos were manipulated. And what he did is he photoshopped results to make his, his theory, his hypothesis, look like it was true, like the data confirmed mm -hmm. it. Oh, I've made a hypothesis about amyloid beta plaques and Alzheimer's, and I can show. And he narrowed it down to a particular molecule. And it has a very fancy name and number, which we shan't concern ourselves with today. But he basically said, oh, no, look at this. All this data shows I am right. You can trust me. You can base your results and your next research step on my solid research results. And money people, you can put the money into the research based on my work because I'm showing that these things are I know now the individual molecule. And if you mm -hmm. know an individual molecule that's doing the job, you can maybe design an enzyme, an antibody, <clears throat> some kind of block in the synthetic pathway so your body won't make this anymore. Uh, this kind of therapy is done all the time in modern medicine and pharmaceutical therapies. And these scientists went back and said, uh-uh, it's not true. Look at this. The results are fake. And mm -hmm. the editors at Science, I, Science Journal, I do not hold them at fault because they 
are a peer reviewed journal. They don't even claim to be experts in every field they publish on. That's why they do peer review. Mm -hmm. He fooled his peers. He fooled yeah. his peers yeah. who are looking at the room. And when you review these things, and I've, I've been a peer reviewer, you look at the research methods, you look at the data, you look, does the data support the conclusions? Are the research methods legit? Are his statistical analyses correct? And I haven't ever gone into, well, but is he faking it? I, I never, yeah. I never went that. I always kind of assumed my fellow scientist was a person of distinction and honor and yeah. credible. After all, yeah. these are, these are people who are well known in their field. They are major players in their particular area of expertise, which is usually relatively narrow, but they're uh -huh. also, you know, they're people who work for major research institutes or universities. And you kind of go, well, big name you or giant research corp or yeah. <clears throat> famous Institute incorporated wouldn't have hired these guys if they were fakes. Right. Mm -hmm. So yeah. there's a lot of, there's a lot of, of course, you're a member of the club. We, of course we trust you, <laughs> which is, I, you know, aren't the history of uh, scammers, you know, first we get in as members of the country club and then we can, you know, we can scam them all. Whatever you want. <laughs> exactly. Do so whatever it's you it's want. an old idea, but um, the original paper now seems completely fraudulent. And Science Magazine has flagged the articles and they've said, mm -hmm. these are problematic. Please use care when referencing these results. Um, nobody come, wants to come out and said, ah, sorry, dudes, we were scammed. <laughs> <laughs> no, because they don't, they don't, don't wanna, they don't wanna look bad. <laughs> no, <clears throat> they don't wanna own that. I mean, they're yep. in the business of publishing the very latest research mm -hmm. in fields across science, and they are one of the most famous and prestigious science journals, and they don't want to come out and say, this is their way of saying, sorry, dudes, we were scammed. These are problematic <laughs> articles. Please use care when quoting these results. <clears throat> but a lot of times people say, but, but Doc, how, how, do the, how do the bad ideas gain momentum, right? How do they do this? Mm -hmm. Well, part of it is, is the, you're a member of the club, so we trust you thing. So, but the other thing is that there really is a snowball effect. Once a paper gets cited a couple of hundred times and part of any research project, any scientist will tell you is the literature review. Oh, you want to do a submit a grant for research in X, Y, or Z? Fine, if you're doing this as a project for a university, a major publication, you need to do a literature review, which means you go to the library and crawl into the stacks, you crawl into uh, mm -hmm. websites and you look for all the previous research on X. And whether it's amyloid beta plaques or uh, a new planet beyond Pluto <clears throat> or a theory of low yield supernovae I don't care what you're talking about. If you're going to do research on it, you got to show that you know everything that's been done. In other words, you've got to post your chops, your bona fides for being a researcher who knows what they are speaking of. But eventually things get cited. Mm -hmm. The paper on the Higgs boson, which was about what, a decade and a half, two decades ago now? Mm -hmm. uh, that paper, by the way, had 1,600 authors. Wow. You know, that, yeah. And it's been cited thousands of times. Once something gets cited more than a couple hundred times, you come up in search engines. Yeah, right? you do, actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Once, once you've been cited a few hundred times and other researchers have said, oh, I, I'm quoting Dr. Barth in Star Mentor, or I'm quoting you know, Dr. Salk on vaccines, uh, <laughs> quoting yeah. Fleming on antibiotics. Once yeah. this thing gets cited a few hundred times and think shares and retweets, folks, right? If something goes viral, things go viral mm -hmm. in science too by being cited many times. And once they do, people who are doing literature reviews 
no longer review that paper. They said, oh, look, it's been cited 250 times. It must be true. It has this weight behind it. And yeah. we know that there are internet scammers. We know there are mm -hmm. viral videos. And <clears throat> what was the most recent one? There's a, a wooden gadget with a little bowl and a little metal track and the marble rolls down and jumps back up and rolls around and rolls down and jumps back up. Perpetual motion machine. No, it's not. <clears throat> it's powered by <laughs> magnets. The magnet accelerates yeah. because you can't drop something. Try this at home. Take a rubber ball, ping pong ball, doesn't matter. Hold up a ruler, drop it. And when it bounces, it will never come up to the point because there's a loss of energy. If you can hear it bounce, yeah. it's losing energy, right? Some energy is carried yeah. around the sound. So the idea of perpetual motion is bogus. And yet I can't tell you how many people I've seen who sent this to me. Oh, look, Dr. Barth, they've discovered perpetual motion. I'm like, no, and don't buy that because it takes battery. <laughs> well, what was a perpetual motion? Well, when the battery runs out, it doesn't work anymore. The magnet, <laughs> and I try to explain to people, and they, oh, no, but I've seen videos on, on Facebook and YouTube. Yes, I know. Um, no. You it's, shouldn't it's believe a, everything I mean, on the internet. <laughs> no. <laughs> but at some, point, at some point, when enough people say, I've seen X, it's really hard to knock it down. Mm -hmm. And Scott and I know one. Scott knows the guy who started this. Oh, Mars will appear as that's that's the gadget. Paul has found a clip, and there's the gadget, and they are plugging in the battery, which powers an electromagnet. And uh, there it goes. And it's a fun desktop toy. Yeah. And uh, once it's on, I guess the video will show us how it works here. And uh, there you go. They're taking out the little metal balls. And uh, it's a fun desktop toy. And I would, I would buy one myself and set it up in a physics class and say, why is it? You can't touch it. You can just look at it. Why isn't this perpetual motion? <coughs> Here we go. <laughs> it's a cheap version. It's stuck. And, uh, oh, he's got, he's got a cheap one. He's got a little... It's got a little uh, rotary thing. It's, it's not turned on. Oh, well. anyway. <laughs> that didn't work. <laughs> that didn't work. That did Maybe he's work. got it working here. There we go. Oh, yeah. And this one has a little uh, electric motor that flings it down. And uh, uh, yeah, it gives it a little extra energy so it can make it back up into the dish again. And yeah, sure. There are a number of ways to make that work. One way is a little rotor. One way is a magnet. And uh, frankly, it's just like a grandfather clock. It appears to just tick forever, but no, it's that falling weight provides the enough energy to keep the pendulum going. You always have to wind um, the clock. It you do. doesn't go on forever. And with that gadget, you have to wind the mechanism by putting in a battery. You have to supply it with energy. <laughs> so, but once something gets shown a number of times, it acquires Vox Populi, Vox Die, you know, the voice of the people is the voice of God. Uh, mm -hmm. So say, says Mark Antony. And yeah. uh, what happens here is, yeah, people have, enough people have seen it that they believe it. The, uh, the thing that Scott and I talk about sometimes, oh, Mars is going to be close enough, it'll look as big as the full moon. Somebody was talking about how Mars looks in a telescope at opposition and misspoke mm -hmm. and that went viral and i still get questions every time mars is at a, oh is it oh, going to be as big as the full moon i try to tell people no if mars looks as big as the full moon put your head between your knees kiss your butt goodbye because it's going to be a really <laughs> bad day <laughs> <laughs> that's true uh, anyway um, so this has been terrible will alzheimer's research recover and i saw an article that, oh this fraud will uh, of course it will recover Mm -hmm. We had more than 2,000 years of the Earth as the center of the solar system. Mm -hmm. And you know what? Even in the 1600s, by 1700, it was 
<clears throat> the old Earth-centered system was no longer accepted by anybody who was serious. Mm -hmm. They all knew. So yes, of course, yeah. science as an institution, Annie, is self-correcting mm -hmm. because yeah. when things like this happen, with or without malice of forethought, right? Whether it was a planned mm -hmm. prank, spoof, fraud, yeah. or just an honest mistake, science will correct itself. You cannot maintain a scientific fraud against mm -hmm. the onslaught of data. The tidal wave of data will eventually come ashore and overwhelm any fraud, any error, and the negative painful and stress sometimes it causes division within the community for a while mm -hmm. but you know what any stress it causes to an individual i am shamed i supported this or i believe this oh no i was fooled you know what that's mm -hmm. irrelevant oh we yeah. got scammed out of a billion dollars that's irrelevant well it yeah. was your billion dollars and maybe my tax dollars but still in terms of science it's irrelevant the yeah. error cannot withstand the flood of new data. No political yeah. or social convention or system can withstand the onslaught of new data. I'm not mm -hmm. sure who said it. There is no, there is nothing so powerful as an idea whose time has come. And I'm not sure, I think somebody said that about Darwin and evolution, but in mm -hmm. fact, you can't build a sound foundation on lies and error. Eventually, yeah. it collapses. Yeah, And it doesn't matter if it's a lie or if it's just a mistake. That doesn't matter yeah. ultimately in the long term either because the truth will out. The motto mm -hmm. of Caltech, Veritas Barabbas, the truth will set you free. And <laughs> uh, or as Shakespeare said, murder will out. <laughs> The truth will come out. You can't, yeah. uh, you know, you may die before your crime is discovered, but it's not going to remain dis undiscovered forever. Uh, yeah. You know, Herbert Hoover and his his fancy clothes in the closet. We didn't know until after he died, but the truth comes out, guys. Uh, yeah, yeah, it is. And uh, <laughs> so this is this is just a really it's an interesting current day because we've talked many times about oh uh thing about heliocentric geocentric and copernicus and galileo versus the church and the political institution in the mm -hmm. uh 17th century and uh copernicus was so afraid of his own employer his organization the church that mm -hmm. he had you know copernicus had only one student in his entire life Oh and it goodness, wasn't I didn't until, know that. Was, yeah, he had one student, Joaquin Redicus. Uh, okay. One student who was a German Protestant gay guy. And Copernicus <laughs> is a Catholic cleric. Okay. Yeah. But science unites these people. You know what? Uh, they both were able to say, you know what? Your social, political, religious background doesn't matter. It's all about the science. Let's get together yeah. on this. And uh, yeah. Redicus published Copernicus's work. And so it's it's a uh, it's probably an apocryphal story, and it, it it sounds great. I don't know if it's true. The story is mm -hmm. uh, Copernicus gave Redicus his life savings, and it was important because Redicus was a German, and uh, yeah. Copernicus was in what's now Poland, but uh, under the Catholic rule, and he couldn't get it published in any Catholic land, and so mm -hmm. he gave it to Redicus, who was. German and they were among the Lutheran Reformation. They didn't give a fig what the Pope thought. And he took it and he got it published and he brought it back. And Copernicus spent his life savings. He didn't know. And as mm -hmm. the story goes, Copernicus is dying in his tower room at the castle at Frauberg, the, the, the uh, monastery there. And Redicus mm -hmm. comes back and he shows in the book and Copernicus says, my God, thank you. It is finished. And he goes into a coma and he dies the next day. He stays alive yeah. long enough to see his published work. Whether that's absolutely true or not, I don't know. It's a great yeah. story. But he was so afraid that he, he wouldn't publish until he knew he was very old and they couldn't really do anything to him. Uh, Galileo became more radical as he got older. 
And he was mm -hmm. a very old and sick man when he appeared before the, uh, the Inquisition and was forced mm -hmm. to recant and say, mm -hmm. forgive me for my error. The earth is fixed. <clears throat> it's the center of the solar system. It does not spin. It does not revolve around anything. It doesn't spin on its axis. And again, the apocryphal story, as he rose from his knees, he mutters defiantly, si mueve, and yet it <laughs> moves. And, yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, you know, awesome. the awesome. flood of data will vindicate you if you are right. Yeah. And if you're a crank, you just end up on an old astronomer's bookshelf as a curiosity. Yeah. So, but I, uh, but I, I think I think it's really neat how we as as we as humans are curious and still want to continue to study those things, and then that way we oh, yes. that way we do you end up you end up proving things and finding out a different story, um, because like I said earlier, you could just say it was set, set in stone, and if we didn't have that knack to be able to to want to learn more and 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 involve and evolve in that in our knowledge then we would just be stuck where we're at and so that's really yes. really neat to think about you know even though it's really bad people do that and um and scam and science and stuff like that it's it's kind of nice to see that yeah. we overcome no matter what and we, do. we continue to learn we continue to learn and study so and that's really neat Yep, there have been there have been wars and millions of people have mm -hmm. died in wars mm -hmm. over religious and philosophical controversies. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look up the history of uh, Catholic heresies, mm -hmm. uh, Umberto Eco's book, The Name of the Rose, will be by Sean Connery. Uh -huh. Very good. Mm -hmm. uh, he talks about all the different heresies and you go, really? Uh, people killed each other because somebody said Christ didn't own the clothes he wore. Uh, yes, they did. The nice thing about science is you can eventually decide with data. Yeah. Unlike philosophical, yeah. political, or religious positions, you can eventually decide with data. Yeah. Yeah. You can eventually decide. Yeah. And, uh, you often see people with political, religious, or philosophical convictions trying to sound like a scientist. You rarely yeah. find a scientist trying to sound like a religious figure or a philosopher or a politician yeah as yeah. a way of proving their point yeah scientists go back to the data and yeah the data will out and your falsehood for whatever motivation or whatever error yeah will not stand science is ultimately yeah. self correcting which is the source of all its power that's why we can put a probe that's why we can put a rover the size of a small car on Mars. And that's why yeah. we can have a telescope like the Webb that can see yeah. back to the dawn of time, literally when light broke out in the universe. Yeah. And we can have, yeah. you know, medical therapies, um, yeah. you know, medical medicine advances, uh, the heart attack yeah. that killed my father. Uh, in the mid nineties, the, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the 25th anniversary of the Pathfinder probe. That's when my father passed away. And oh. I had that same heart attack 20 some years, you know, 20 years later, medical yeah. technology then saved my life would have saved his, yeah. but they didn't have it yeah. back in the day. Yeah. And yeah. you know, the yeah. reason I'm alive is because science is self correct Yeah. Yeah. So there you go. Did yeah, we have that's any a good, it was good. I didn't, I didn't see, I only saw one comment. I don't know. Um, Paul, did we have any uh, very much chatting going on on YouTube on the channel? <clears throat> All right. Let's All right. see. So, medical so research. research, Mike Wiesner. Uh, he says medical research has implicated artificial light at night as a culprit in Alzheimer's disease. It costs less to deal with light pollution than develop a cure. Uh, all I will say to Mike is that, uh, yes, light pollution is awful, but most of the light that they're talking about uh, happens inside our home and we power it on our own electric bill. We have yeah. night lights. We have uh, <laughs> people. God, my mother used to every single night would fall asleep on the couch in front of the television. 
uh, literally since I was a young boy, I remember, you know, her, you know, staying up and she would fall asleep and, and this light bathing her all the time. Um, we insist on bright lights in our yards, but we also light up the interior of our home. <laughs> and when I, I've had guests to stay here at the ranch and they're going, what the hell? It's like a mummy's tomb in here at night. I'm like, yes, it's night. It should be dark. Yeah. Well, how can I see to get to the, get to the bathroom if I wake up and I'm staying? I'm like, like, why don't you, uh, you know, well, why don't you just put on lights? No. Uh, so, wasting the electricity <laughs> Mike, Mike Overracker <laughs> says is if it's on the internet, <laughs> it must be true. That's yes, about, everything's that's true on the internet. That's exactly <laughs> the same reason why you can confidently say, I heard it from Dr. Barth on How Do You Know? It must be true. Well, don't well, any of you. I saw that earlier. Uh, I, think I think Mike. Mike needs to be more mindful because the first time I saw this comment, it was attributed to Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> yes. My TDNA X chromosome has been described as a subject to early onset dementia. So most of our family studies stays active learning. Okay. Okay. Uh, keeping mentally active new learning studying new things, even crossword puzzles, things like that. Yes, they, the research has shown that uh, staying mentally active as opposing to, you know, YouTube and chill until you die, that helps you avoid cognitive decline and not just dementia, just plain old cognitive decline. Uh, so yes, as for the link to a particular chromosome, uh, sorry, Harold, I'm going to have to be honest and say that's not my area of expertise. Even though I once did research in molecular genetics and uh, <laughs> turn on cancers, that was the research I was. Uh, my research group was working on. I was not leading that, folks. I was a junior. Uh, I, the research leader would design the experiments. I would be the jerk in the corner lab doing all the sloppy work with trays and plates and different things. But um, no, sorry, I can't comment on that. That's way so, beyond my so expertise. Osmosis, Osmosis says, says, so the scientific so field is essentially a middle school middle recess school yard. That's Karl Popper in a nutshell, my friend. Yes, <laughs> that is. And I, I encourage you to go do some reading on Karl Popper, everybody. Uh, it's, not, it's not difficult reading. He's a fascinating guy. Uh, and he's more of a philosopher than a scientist. Um, but yes, that's that's effectively, I, I refer to it as a cage match. You said middle school recess yard. And I, the middle school recess yard analogy has a lot of validity because there's a lot of mudslinging and name calling. And Dr. Schmo is just a knucklehead or he would have known that his theory is stupid. And there's it gets very juvenile. I have seen <laughs> fist fights at science conferences that look like a sixth grade slap fight, um, you know. <laughs> um, yes, I have. Um, oh, oh. And I, the, I'm just going to remain the in the The combatants shall not gallery. be named. So there you go. But that looks like anyway, all the questions yeah, that we have. Okay. Uh, once again, folks, <laughs> as we wrap it up here, uh, I hope that uh, if you have questions and if you're like me, uh, you always think of your best questions mm -hmm. five minutes after the program is over. Uh, email me at astronomyforeducators at gmail.com, and I will be happy to take your questions up in a future program. And yes, we're going to throw this plug up uh, because authors are <laughs> shameless. Uh, Star Mentor is out there on Amazon. We hope you'll get a copy. We hope you'll do a review. And yeah. uh, we hope you'll go out this week and take a look at the Perseids. And uh, yeah, take a pair of binoculars to peer at the full moon. Great, full moon is a great time to look for crater rays. Crater rays never show up except a couple days on either side of the full moon. And crater Tycho, uh, right near the meridian, moon's meridian in the southern hemisphere, has a fantastic thousand mile long uh, ray system. And it's absolutely beautiful. You can see the ejecta patterns and ray systems for craters Copernicus, Kepler, and others. So it's a great 
oh, the full moon is too bright. So make lemonade, you know? People, life gives you lemon. Uh, go out there and take a look at some of the uh, crater systems and ray systems and ejecta systems on the moon during the full moon because a couple of days either side of the full moon, they're not visible any other time because they're visible because of reflection, not because of shadows with highly angled light. <clears throat> Get out there, keep looking up, and uh, clear skies to everybody. And we'll see you yeah. next week. Yeah. See y'all later.